Modern product management started with this man in 1931. Sort of. This is the real history of product management. The history is foggy because where a product manager's job begins and ends, is very foggy. Let's take it back to the product managers of a simpler time, maybe 1500 BC. The product managers in the blacksmith trade. A customer named Edward asks his local blacksmith, can you make me the strongest sword possible with today's technology? It's 1500 BC and I'm fighting Sir John to the death next week. The blacksmith salesperson says, yeah, I'll take your money. Now this blacksmith salesperson also happens to be the product manager. Let's call him blacksmith PM. I'm not hiring a man actor. This is low budget. He's got a boss, the blacksmith owner, but his workplace is unique. He works with an entire team of blacksmiths. One specializes in design. Another is a salesperson who didn't show up to work today. One is a metalsmith engineer, a marketer, and so on. But he can't fire any of them. They're all related to the owner. Even though he is responsible for keeping everyone on track, jumping in wherever needed, and producing a sword for Edward to fight next week. Clock's ticking. That is the job of a PM. Full responsibility of a product with no authority to fire anyone. Next week rolls around and... Blacksmith PM was able to produce the strongest, most beautiful sword money could buy. He did product management stuff like communicate the customer's needs, the needs of all his blacksmith technologists who speak different languages, mind you, all while keeping the product on time and at a cost that was both of value to the business and the customer. As Ken Norton says, product management is the glue that holds together all the various functions and roles across a company that speak different languages. Edward took his strong, beautiful sword to battle, and was promptly killed at the hands of a competitor's sword. It turns out product management is and always has been very difficult. Blacksmith PM built exactly what his customer asked for, the strongest sword technology could make, but it was also very heavy and very slow, too slow for Edward. Edward is dead. Edward asked for the strongest sword and Blacksmith PM made a classic product manager mistake giving the customer exactly what they asked for. The competitor's blacksmith, let's call him PM2, used more advanced product management tactics. PM2 worked with his metalsmith engineer to communicate that his customer, Sir John, asked for the strongest sword. I want a stronger, heavier sword than Edward's. But what he really wants is to survive a duel to the death in one week. His data analyst also gave him some quantitative data showing that the heavy steel swords were losing matches down at the sword fighting gym, if that's what they called it, to lighter swords from new technology, maybe Valerian steel. PM2 and his engineer worked side by side with a Valerian steel prototype, testing it with the customer all week and necessary iterations were made. PM2 didn't command the best sword to be made. He communicated the actual needs of the customer and each member of his team to produce a sword that was valuable to the customer and the business. Sir John won. His sword was better. It was a small town. Everybody knows it. Edward is dead. PM2 is the new sword guy in town. By my course. From a historical context, product management has been used as long as humans have been trying to figure out the right thing to build for customers. And the right thing to build was easier back then because communication was superior. People only made a single custom product at a time for a customer that they knew deeply with technology that was generally understood by the entire team and the results of their labor had clear results, which the entire village understood. After all, Edward was dead and everyone knows why. Jump forward to industrialization and problems arise. You see companies start to produce thousands of products for customers they've never met sold by salespeople they don't know, built by people they've never talked to. The greatest strength of a product manager is communication. The problem is that technology expands our customer reach and therefore reduces our customer communication. Technology expands our knowledge, increasing our knowledge gaps between teams and therefore reduces communication. That is why the need for product management will grow as technology distances us further from the customer and increases the knowledge gaps between team members a theme that will continue to ripple in history. That brings us to the book, Product Leadership. They give a fantastic overview of modern day product management, which I will briefly summarize with fun updates of my own. This is Neil H. McElroy, and in 1931, he wrote an 800 word memo 
that outlined the need for brand men, or what would become known as a product manager. McElroy was frustrated while advertising Kamei soap at Procter & Gamble. He couldn't figure out why it was losing to PNG's own flagship soap, Ivory. It was the same communication problem that formed in all mass production. You had the expansion of all these manufacturing roles, yet no one knew why the customer at local stores weren't buying Kamei. Somebody needed to go personally to the consumer and ask, what is it about ivory soap that's better? Is it the smell, the texture, the text on the package? You had executives busy managing multiple products, but who was fully responsible for Kamei? Nobody. This wasn't about criticizing Kamei soap, it was about learning everything about the brand to take responsibility, experiment with every team involved, and follow the entire production process with sales right to the very finish get to the local stores and talk to customers in order to find out the trouble. Oof, this makes product management advisors like me tingle. I give the same advice to founders today. <laughs> the memo is so good. It instills that somebody must be responsible for communicating the voice of the customer through the entire production process all while working with, communicating with various teams so that they can focus on their jobs. Every product manager should read this today and reread it because nearly a hundred years later, products are failing because their product managers don't know what McElroy knew in 1931. Kamei became an iconic top-selling soap brand. I think it's dead now. Product management is hard. And Procter & Gamble moved beyond soap to become one of the most successful, longest lasting companies in the history of the world. McElroy later helped found a small startup called NASA. And he also advised two young men at Stanford named Bill Hewitt and David Packard. Their company went on to sustain 50 years of unbroken 20% year over year growth between 1943 and 1993. World War II, multiple recessions, stagflation in the 1970s was a disaster. And yet, according to the book, The Hewlett Packard Way, putting brand men as close as possible to the customer to make the product manager the voice of the customer led them to succeed while the rest of the world was in turmoil. HP divided product groups into small self-sustaining organizations where they developed, manufactured, and marketed products all in one cohesive unit. Tiny teams equals big communication. If it got to be over 500 people, they would split it. And these smaller, tighter units allowed specific products to be developed faster for a specific customer. Around the same time, Toyota was perfecting their own version of this called lean manufacturing, where a chief engineer, a Shusa, took on the role of the product manager to take full responsibility of a car with a small dedicated team. Toyota took it a step further and looked at reducing all forms of waste in the production process, including not just physical waste from defective parts, but any waste in the process. Toyota's Shusas were specifically instructed to identify any waste that does not generate value for customers and immediately experiment with ways to solve tiny problems before they turn into millions of problems for customers. But a new technology revolution would present new challenges. You don't even know the technology that your team is capable of because they were literally inventing the future in their minds. The personal computer era would present the need for a new era of brand men. Perhaps not a man at all. Let's see the struggle play out in 1986. In December, the group concluded they must ship product in 18 months and agreed they could be ready. Three months down the line, this seems questionable, and there is frustration in the room. It's totally useless, as far as I can see, to talk about how you're going to implement something unless you know what it is you want to implement. So I, that's what I'm not getting. I'm not getting it from marketing. I'm not getting you know, a clear idea from, from anybody, really, what, uh, what the features are and, and uh, uh, what is this thing that we're talking about doing. That ain't my job. And I don't, if I was him, it wouldn't be my job, it'd be your job. You know, it isn't like this should be something new. That's one. But, I mean, I agree. Let me, let me back up it. So somebody's got to say, here's what we can do, and we can make it happen, and here's the level of thing we can ship in 16 months. And what I hear him saying, hear him saying is, well, anything more than a port of Mac author, forget it. 
And boy, that just makes me smoke. Excuse me, hello, Mr. Steve Jobs, you need a product manager. That's me, I'm the glue that holds everything together. You can stop biting now. That was Steve Jobs at Next, talking about the need for me. The PBS documentary is fascinating. It shows their struggles to launch a next generation of computers and blame gets aimed at marketing or sales or engineering. We've got to have a stake in the ground. And the problem I've got though is one, will everybody believe that the stake is in fact in the ground? And secondly, when software comes back and says what they can do by summer or spring of 87, will they be telling us the truth? That's what I'm worried about. Well, yeah, one of the my, things, that's exactly my point. We've got a person here that said he can do a word processor in six months. It's taking three years. Well, George, I can't change the world, you know? What, what, what do you want me to do? What's the solution? And they really need someone to communicate between everyone. This is what we are building. Here's our priorities and here's our deadline. In the 1980s and 90s, the role of product manager began to emerge with different names other than it's not my job, or it should be his job. Microsoft originally called the job program manager. In the book, One Strategy, Jay Blumenthal describes how it happened. In early 1984, we began to work on a spreadsheet for the Mac. I got involved and became a sort of service organization for the development group. I helped document the specifications, do the manual reviews, and decide what bug fixes were important and what could be postponed to a later release. While I didn't make the design decisions, I made sure they got made. That's really good. The process worked out really well, so they decided to call it something and institutionalize it. Microsoft called it Program Manager, a job title which blurred the lines between project program and product manager over the decades to follow. So it's difficult to say who the first product manager was because it carries many names, including Steve Jobs simply saying, it's not my job, it should be your job. Somebody was doing it, or maybe not. The next computer launched a year late in 1988 and ultimately failed as an expensive computer line. But not all was lost. See this guy? That's Tim Berners-Lee and the next computer that he used to code the first web browser, which became known as the World Wide Web. This would mark the beginning of the next era of technology and a new era of product manager, with the official title of product manager emerging somewhere around 1999. The history is murky, but you have examples like Kate Arnold as the first product manager of Netflix in 1999. Then you have Marissa Mayer, Google's first female engineer in 1999, slowly take on product manager roles and become the first product manager at Google. Just a year later, in 2002, Mayer started the Associate Product Manager program at Google, a pivotal moment for the product manager profession in many ways. It was a shift away from brand men marketers to an engineering necessity. The waterfall method, where a boss would write a long list of specs and toss it over to engineering to build and hope their customers enjoy their toothpaste or Windows 2000 CD-ROM, were over. The internet was here and it was not static. Could you imagine if Google stopped their algorithm updates in 2000? No software updates were being released at a rapid pace to millions of customers. And once again, technology advances increase communication problems exponentially until it broke the system. So in 2001, 17 software engineers got together in a ski resort and wrote the Agile Manifesto. They took what they'd learned from Scrum and DSDM XP and the learnings from the Toyota production system to, well, I'll just read it, it's short. We are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. Through this work, we have come to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan. That is, while there is value in the items to the right, we value the items on the left more. Just like we saw in the Brand Men memo in 1931, with technology moving us farther away from the customer, we had to refocus on the customer collaboration. Things were moving too fast. It wasn't that a plan was no longer important. It was that responding to change became more important. Engineers could no longer follow orders from that dumb brand man that didn't understand their technology. 
That's me. Which had created an adversarial atmosphere. Well, yeah, one of the my, things, that's exactly my point. We've got a person here that said he can do a word processor in six months. It's taking three years. They needed a seat at the table. Engineering and product would work together to experiment, to learn about their customers' needs before they built their final product. Agile created a harmonious atmosphere of collaboration where product and engineering no longer fight and customers are now delivered perfect products. The Lean startup built upon all of this in 2011. It focused the entire company, not just the product, on learning what the customer wants through rapid experimentation, shorter sprints, continuous improvement, communication, and customer focus. History ripples. As technology has increased our distance to customers, the number of product managers on LinkedIn has grown to over a million. You can go to Carnegie Mellon for a Master of Science in Product Management. We now have Chief Product Officers, a name far above the title. That ain't my job. And I don't, if I was him, it wouldn't be my job, it'd be your job. You know, it isn't like this should be something new. 